Now thank we all our God with heart and hands and voices, who wondrous things has done and whom this world rejoices, who from our mother's arms has blessed us on our way with countless gifts of love and still is ours today. You just sang those words and I tell you, as long as I breathe and live and stand in a pulpit, that will be sung by every congregation that I serve. And for those of you who say I never do an old hymn, that one is from the 16th century, boys and girls. But you know what I love about it? I love the story behind it. It was written by a man named Martin Rinkert, who was a pastor in Germany. Martin Rinkert was a pastor during the Thirty Years' War. Now, we seem to think that COVID's gone on for 30 years. Not yet. 30 years. Think about Do the math. How old were you 30 years ago? I was in my 30s. My knees worked, and I didn't need my glasses to see. He was also a priest during the time of the Great Plague. And at the height of the plague, he did 50 funerals a day, including his wife's. There were so many people dying that they suddenly couldn't fill the cemeteries. The cemeteries were full, so they started digging trenches along the side of the road and burying thousands of people at a time. Tens of thousands of people died during that plague. And yet, he sits down and writes these words, now thank we all our God with heart and hands and voices. That is someone whose faith shames my own. Fast forward to the year 2021. Things are a little bit different, don't you think, in the world? Because now we don't have Thanksgiving. We do have Thanksgiving, and I hope you all gave thanks on, how many of you remember to give thanks to God on Thanksgiving? You're not gonna, you're not gonna say, oh, I forgot about that in the midst of pumpkin pie and football and turkey and all that good stuff. I hope you gave thanks to God. We don't have Thanksgiving anymore, we have thanks for giving. Have you heard those commercials, thanks for giving? Organizations that collect food and things like that are saying thanks for giving, which puts the recipient of thanks with who? The people giving the food, the people working. Then we have Friendsgiving. And I was actually invited to a Friendsgiving celebration this year. What is Friendsgiving? You know what that means when people come together and have a meal and somebody brings a turkey and somebody who doesn't cook gets the cranberry sauce in the can? That's what Friendsgiving is. But if it's Friendsgiving, who gets the thanks for that? The friends or yourself if you bring something. Then I found out something this year that really frosted my pumpkin. It's called Drinksgiving. <laughs> Anybody heard about Drinksgiving? And if you celebrate Drinksgiving, if you did, don't raise your hand because I'm going to come and have a talk with you later. <laughs> Drinksgiving is the Wednesday evening before Thanksgiving. It's celebrated on college campuses across the United States when people see how much they can drink. <sighs> we got a lot of work to do. Now, if you remember, this is the third of a series of three sermons based on that passage that we read this morning from the call to worship. And what was that? Thessalonians, what was the first week we talked about? Rejoice when? Always. always. Some of you are remembering this. Rejoice always. What was the next week? Pray without ceasing. ceasing. And today is what? Give thanks in all circumstances. In all circumstances. And today we sort of morphed last week was Christ the King Sunday, and now we are into the first Sunday of Advent. But I still think that to have hope, to look forward in hope, begins with giving thanks. And so we had a Thanksgiving observance, and if you're saying, oh, Pastor Terry, we are so past Thanksgiving now. How many of you have leftovers? Anybody still have some leftovers left? How many of you are done with turkey? Just done with it. Got some hands in the back going out. How many of you are done with pie? No one is ever done with pie, I tell you that. Oh, you're done with pie, Toby? Kind of, okay. Well, if you're, a Hallmark movie fan, which some of you are, I know. Christmas started for you months ago. You know, this is old stuff now. But we're moving toward Christmas as a celebration and an observance, but Advent is all about looking to the future of Christ, the future reign of Christ, Christ who was and is and is to come, Christ who will come again. Why? Because he told us he's coming back. Now, when we had our study between the services, I confessed that group, if I were Jesus, I'd be saying to God, do I really have to go back there? Because these people have made a mess of things all over again. But that's where these passages enlighten us. The passage from Jeremiah. I love Jeremiah, and I asked folks at the first service, what do you know about Jeremiah? And one person said, let me be honest, I don't know a thing about Jeremiah other than he's in the Bible. 
Jeremiah is my favorite Old Testament prophet and probably my favorite character other than Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He was one of the great prophets of Israel, one of the prophets who talked about the exile. That's why if you see a painting of Jeremiah, he's always bald. We don't know what he looked like. There were no photographs back then. But you know why he's bald? Because he tore his hair out because people frustrated him so much. That's why if I had it to do over again, Jeremiah is the prophet whose call I most identify with in scripture. See, when you want to be ordained as a United Methodist pastor, you have to answer questions. And the first question they ask you is, whose biblical call story is most like yours? My answer used to be Sarah, wife of Abraham, because when she was told that she was going to conceive and bear a child and she was 90-some years old, what did she do? She laughed. When God said, Terry, I'd like you to be a pastor, Terry laughed. Terry laughed. Everybody who knew Terry laughed at that time. But now it's Jeremiah. Jeremiah was called at a very young age. He was called as a teenager, and he said, I don't know what I'm supposed to say. God said, don't worry, I'm going to give you the words. And as he ages, one of my favorite passages of Jeremiah is when he is saying, I just want to say happy stuff. I want people to like me. I want to walk into a room and give them some good news for a change. I want people to say, we just really love having you around Jeremiah. Yes, yes, yes. No pastor ever gets that response. Let me tell you that right now. But then Jeremiah says, even though I want to say something good and happy and make everybody feel good about themselves, I have a fire in my bones and I have to tell them what God wants me to say. And that's where I am today. This is a passage similar to that because Jeremiah was the prophet of gloom and doom and exile. Nebuchadnezzar's going to get you. God is going to let you reap what you've sown, folks. You've, you've turned away from God. Your apostasy, your faithlessness has left God so ticked off of you that you're going to get what you deserve. Now, even though people got what they deserved when they turned from God and they forgot to say that, oh, thank you, Lord, for all you've done for us, when they started to look at all the things that they had accomplished on their own and forgot who was the source of their strength, who was the source of their victories, who was the source of their providence. Everything they had came from God's loving hand, and when they forgot to, who had been the source of all that, God let them be carried into exile. To be in exile in Babylon didn't mean that they were locked up, they weren't chained up, they weren't behind bars. And God allowed the forces from Babylon to take the cream of their crop, so to speak, the artisans, the tradespeople, and they were carried away. Now Jeremiah finds out that the armies of Babylon are on the border of the land. They're going to be invaded. Everything's going to be taken from them. What does he do? He goes out and he buys a vineyard in the middle of Anatop. And people said, you're crazy. If you knew that an atomic bomb was headed toward you, would you buy a piece of property at ground zero? That is what he is doing right now, ground zero. So why would he do that? Because once a prophet gets your attention and says, God's going to let you reap what you've sown, his next message is, God is going to redeem you in a big way. And so in this passage, he's writing to those exiles. He's writing to the priests that remain. What does he say to them? Build houses where you are. Take wives, get married, have children, and let your children get married and have children, which means you're going to be there a while until you learn the lesson that you need to learn. But then God is going to bring them home. That is the hope that sustained people for so many centuries between the time of the exile and the birth of Jesus, the Messiah. They were sustained by hope. Which is why I picked the passage from 1 Peter today. What is, what is it that we're called to do? Have unity of spirit, sympathy, love for one another, a tender heart, a humble mind. Do not repay evil for evil or abuse for abuse, but on the contrary, repay with a blessing. It is for this that you were called, that you might inherit a blessing. We're not supposed to fight and fuss and cuss and holler at each other, much less the rest of the world. We are called to live in the grace and the peace of Jesus Christ. And the passage that ends this way, always be ready to make your defense to anyone who demands from you an account of the hope that is in you. We have to be a people of hope. We have to be a people of real hope, not just false hope. This is not some pie in the sky thought of what might happen one day. We have to proclaim and reclaim that Jesus Christ who came, who died, who was raised for us is coming again. But until that time, let's look at what he says in the Gospel of Luke again. This is Jesus after he has come from the wilderness where he has been tempted and tested. He comes and he goes to his hometown church, his local synagogue. And they hand him the scroll of the prophet Isaiah, and this is the part that he reads to them. I'm going to read it to you again. 
The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolls up the scroll and he hands it back to them. He says, today this has been fulfilled in your hearing. What do they do next? They're amazed, they're marvelous, and then they take him out and they want to throw him off a cliff. Because good news is not good news for everyone. If you're an oppressor, the end of oppression is not a good news for you, is it? Or if you just don't want to think this is the one who he says he is. But we know who Christ is. We know that he came to be one of us. He came to be among us. He came to experience everything in human life that we can experience. I have never understood why what we have is Isaiah. Jesus leaves out an important line, one of the best lines for me in all of it. In Isaiah's scripture, as we recorded in our 21st century scriptures, he came to preach good news to the poor and all those things, but to bind up the brokenhearted. I don't know about you, but my heart's been broken pretty badly sometimes. And the promise that God has come in Jesus Christ to bind up my broken heart fills me with hope. You know what else fills me with hope? Epworth United Methodist Church fills me with hope. We have had a couple years, haven't we, together? We have lost so many things. Some of us have lost family members and loved ones in that greater sense that they have gone on to be with Christ in a way that we hope for. We've lost people because they don't want to wear a mask to church. We've lost people because they don't want to be here anymore. They want to go some other place. We've lost people just because they're so out of the habit of coming here on Sunday morning that now they're not doing anything or watching any service online. We've lost people to despair over this pandemic. But I've seen Epworth at work in the midst of that. We have Sunday school online. It may not be the best that we can do, but it's the best we can do right now, and we're going to continue to do that. We have continued in mission. Our mission team went out and put a ramp on a house. Imagine being in the pandemic without the ability to even leave your home because you can't get out the front door down those steps. We've continued to support the Cockeysville Food Bank, and I have a feeling that ladies who are not here crocheting in person are at home crocheting baby hats. Am I right about that? Because there are still babies being born in the midst of all this. And you know what else gives me hope? That nine people this morning are gonna join with our congregation and make covenant with us, to be part of who we are in the body of Christ. In the midst of the pandemic, we continue to be the people of God in Jesus Christ. And I hope to heaven that that is enough for you to be able to say when someone asks you, why do you bother to get up on Sunday morning and go to that place to worship some unknown deity that you say, because my Savior has come to me in a profound way. He has bound up my broken heart. He has inspired me to go into the world to love, not to repay evil for evil, but to repay evil with good. So go buy yourself a field in the middle of ground zero and tell somebody you're doing it because Jesus Christ who has come, will come again to redeem us and take us to where we need to be. Let that be Advent for you. Look to the future of Christ, not with fear. This is not a time, someone gave me a bumper sticker once, I was too, I thought it was too funny, I never put it on my car, I said, Jesus is coming, look busy. It's not about that. It's about, it's not about how good you are, it's not about what you've done or left undone, it is about the grace of God that has come into your heart through Christ your Savior. If that is not reason to hope, I don't know what is. But don't forget the thanksgiving, because it is thanksgiving that causes us to hope. If we can't remember the source of all that we have, oh God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come. If we don't remember that, then we are gonna be like those people wandering out in the desert going, what happened, Lord? Why'd you turn against me? Instead of just saying, I wandered from the path and now I gotta find my way back. God sent Jesus, our Lord, to bring us home. So this Advent, let it be a homecoming for you. Let it be a time of thanksgiving, a time of praise, a time of preparation, a time of rejoicing always, a time to pray without ceasing, and a time to give thanks in all circumstances. I want to end this morning with something written quite a few years ago now, and I bet some of you may recognize who wrote it. Sorry, I have to change glasses because I broke the ones that work for everything and now I have to put on the ones that work semi for everything else. 
The year that is drawing towards its close has been filled with blessings of fruitful fields and healthful skies. To these bounties which are so constantly enjoyed that we might be prone to forget the source from which they come, others have been added, which are so of so extraordinary a nature that they cannot fail to penetrate and soften even the heart which is habitually insensible to the ever watchful providence of Almighty God. In the midst of a civil war of unequaled magnitude and severity, which has sometimes seemed to foreign states to invite and or to provoke their aggression, peace has been preserved with all nations, order has been maintained, the laws have been respected and obeyed, and harmony has prevailed everywhere except in the theater of military conflict while that theater has been greatly contracted by the advancing armies and navies of the Union. Needful diversions of wealth and strength from the fields of peaceful industry to the national defense have not arrested the plow, the shuttle, or the ship. The axe has enlarged the borders of our settlements, uh, have yielded even more abundantly than heretofore. Population has steadily increased, notwithstanding the waste that has been made in the camp, the siege of the battlefield, and the country, rejoicing in the conscientiousness of augmented strength and vigor is permitted to expect in continuance of years with large increase of freedom. No human counsel hath devised, nor hath any mortal hand worked out these great things. They are gracious gifts of the Most High God, who, while dealing with us in anger for our sins, has nevertheless remembered mercy. It seems to me fit and proper that they should be solemnly, reverently, and gratefully acknowledged as with one heart and one voice by the whole American people. I do therefore invite my fellow citizens in every part of the United States, and also those who are at sea and those who are sojourning in foreign lands, to set apart and observe that last Thursday of November next as a day of thanksgiving and praise to our beneficent Father who dwelleth in the heavens. I recommend them that while, I offering, up, that while offering up the ascriptions justly due to him for such a singular deliverance and blessing, they do also with humble penitence for our national perverseness and disobedience, commend to his tender care all those who have become widows, orphans, mourners, or sufferers in the lamentable civil strife in which we are unavoidably engaged, and fervently implore the inter interposition of the Almighty Hand to deal with the wounds of the nation and to restore it as soon as they may be consistent with divine purposes to the full enjoyment of peace, harmony, tranquility, and union. Sorry, I'm having a little trouble reading this morning. But those words were written, you know who wrote those? Abraham Lincoln, during the Civil War. That was when this day in Thanksgiving, the last Thursday in November, the fourth Thursday in November, that was when he decided we needed to stop and give thanks to God. No matter what was going on in the world, we needed to give thanks to God. No matter if we were shooting at each other, we needed to stop and give thanks to God. We needed to call each other back to our right minds and our senses and give thanks to God for all that God had done. He didn't say, though, did he, I command that you give thanks. He said, I invite you to join me in giving thanks. I invite you all to join me in giving thanks, but I invite more than that to a living hope in the God of all things, the one who was and is and is to come in Jesus Christ, so that together we might move forward in hope, trusting in full certain assurance that Christ will come again. And until that day that we live in peace with one another, the world is telling us in America, the world is telling us that we need to hate and mistrust each other because of our political views. That is antithetical to the gospel of Jesus Christ. We can disagree with each other and still maintain unity and peace within our congregation. And I believe within our denomination, if only we will let Christ in. So I hope you will join me in welcoming our newest members to the congregation as a sign of the hope that is ours in Jesus Christ. And my blessings on you as you enter this holy season of Advent, that you make it truly a holy season by every day stopping giving thanks to God and looking to the day when Christ will come. Amen and amen. <laughs>